Post-COVID Update! Welcome to this week's installment of Post-COVID Update. Welcome to church, friends. Two or three scriptures that we have for you today. Happy Sunday, by the way, or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday, and almost Merry Christmas. The first reading is from 2 Samuel, and it'll be 7, 1 through 11 and 16. If you remember the process of selecting King David to preside over God's beloved, Israel, it was far from willy-nilly and just, oh, he'll do, and rather very methodical. Samuel, the priest and prophet of God, appoints Saul, the king. He didn't, God tried to tell the Israelites, you don't need a king. I'm, I'm your Lord and king, but oh, they wanted a king. So they got Saul, and Saul is a mess. And God replaces him with the only person for the job, King David, the shepherd boy, Goliath slayer, remember, and holy hottie. David wasn't perfect, but he had these qualities, a gentle, loving spirit. He cared. He cared about the little sheep that he looked after, boldness. He wrestled a lion and a bear, wrestled sheep from the, from the claws and the, and the teeth of, of two animals ferocious enough to kill him. He had compassion. He rescued the, the lamb because it mattered and was a compassionate person. He didn't like seeing people getting taken advantage of all through, mostly all through his, his kingship. Faith, he loved God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, and all of his strength. He loved God. He was a worshiper. He wrote psalms. He was honest for the most part. He was devoted. He was sold out to God and that was all there was to it. And he was devoted to Saul even as Saul was trying to kill him because he was going to take the throne and Saul didn't want to be deposed. He was a man after God's own heart. God didn't say that in scripture about any other human being. But God said of David, he is a man after my own heart. Pretty good stuff, huh? You notice the word perfect is missing from this list. David wasn't perfect, but he was the perfect person for the job at hand to accomplish and advance God's divine plan. I wonder, did you ever feel like there's more that you could be doing for the Lord? I mean, I think all good people have felt that way. Well, you probably are right, but we can't do, we can't all do more. In his generosity of spirit, David wants to honor God even more. And God says, au contraire, be the person that I've shown you how to be. That'll do. The scripture reading is, as I said, 2 Samuel now, when David the king was settled into his house, he was now king. And the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him. And I mean, they had been numerous trying to kill him, trying to take his life, and, and God stood with him. The king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God, the ark of the covenant, stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. Nathan is a prophet, and uh, David needed to make up his mind for himself. And Nathan had not heard from God at that point. Now, that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, the prophet, saying, God said, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? God is saying this. I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. That's how the Ark of the Covenant was moved in a, and was in the tabernacle for the presence of God. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, 
Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God's asking David these questions. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel, king. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from your enemies, David. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. He will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. We'll get to that before me. I'll read it again. Your house and your kingdom shall be sure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. This is why. Now, this is the promise to David that one of his offspring, one of his offspring, will always be on the throne of Israel. King David, and from thereafter, someone from the lineage of David will reside on the throne now. So why Mary and Joseph? Mary and Joseph, if you look at the lineage and in Matthew, in the first part of Matthew, it looks boring. But if you look at the lineage, you see that Jesus is from the lineage of David, as is his mother and the surrogate father, Joseph, all from the lineage of David, as promised. And that's important for us today. Now, the next reading... Is from Luke 1, 26 through 30, 38. And uh, in it, I say, are the, the most faithful words, in my opinion, in the entire Bible. Okay? In the sixth month, the sixth month of another woman's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Joseph from the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, also from the house of David. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this must be. She was a humble girl. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son, capital S, the Son of the Most High, the Son of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus is our King, King Jesus, and there is no end to his righteousness and his rule. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, which is God Almighty, will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now you're Relative Elizabeth is in her, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. And this would be the mother of John the Baptist pretty soon. 
for nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, as I have called them the most faithful words in Scripture, Mary said, here I am, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. I'm a single girl with a good reputation. My mom and dad aren't going to understand this. I'm going to have to explain it to Joseph. I don't know if he'll get it. My friends are not going to like me because they're going to think I cheated. I've never been a mom. I'm maybe 15 or 14. But let it be unto me according to thy word. I'll have this baby. There's only one place in Scripture that I think compares to this. Of course, all of Jesus' words were wonderful. But Jesus also said something, like, like mother, like son, also said something as bold when he said, not as I will, Father, but as you will. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and God was showing him, the angel was showing him just what it was that he would be enduring. So why Mary? Why this 15-year-old girl or 14-year-old girl? Why her instead of, I don't know, Mary Magdalene? None of them were perfect. And I know that rubs some people, but still there's no human perfect. Only Jesus Christ God in human flesh was perfect. Mary had a gentle, loving spirit. Sound familiar? She had boldness. Only a girl with boldness would say, I'm up, I'm up for this. Let's do it. She had compassion. Look at the way she looked after Jesus as a baby. She had faith. Why am I so special that this angel is coming to me? She was trustworthy. And only the trustworthy are called to great things. God knew that little Mary would be trustworthy. Not perfect. She'd make some mistakes. They lost track of Jesus once. How fun was that? but trustworthy. She was humble. As she questioned the angel, what sort of greeting is this? I'm just a common girl. She was devoted, devoted to Jesus and the rest of her kids and to the disciples. They traveled all together. She was like a mom to them. She became like a mom to John after the cross. Perfect is missing from our list here, too. And that's probably a rub for some people. God picks a person that he can count on. And they might endure many, many things. Uh, Saul, who was punishing the, the Christians, but Saul had been trained as a rabbi, and he understood the Old Testament Wonderfully, he just hadn't seen the Christology in it. He hadn't seen the references to Christ and put that together. Jesus knocked him to his knees on the road to Damascus. And Paul said, Lord, who are you? <laughs> it's me, Jesus, the voice said. And Saul became, he changed his name to Paul. God does that to people sometimes, changes their names. And it's a, it's a sign of newness for them. He knew he could depend on Saul once he became Paul. And so he called him. And Paul wrote much of the New Testament, as you know, I'm sure. But it isn't always so easy for those who God calls. As a matter of fact, it isn't, it isn't the life that you or I would choose. I'll just put it that way. It's not the life that you are. And it's not as if, these people grouse about it, the people in the scriptures. I've got one more example for you today. Genesis 50, 20. You know, Joseph, who had his father made him a coat of many colors. His brothers hated him. His older brothers hated him. They, they 
beat him up and threw him in a pit, thinking, hoping that he would die, told their father, an animal got him, and here, this is the blood of the animal. Oh, look, he's, all, he's dead. Well, he's a good kid. He gets visions from the Lord. He's close to God spiritually. But he gets hauled out of this hole in the ground by traders that are headed back to Egypt, slave traders. They take him back and they sell him. Well, they sell him to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar is in charge of the jails, okay? And he's a servant in Potiphar's house. He gets accused by Potiphar's wife, although he's got nothing to do with her. He gets accused by her of trying to make time with her. Potiphar throws him in jail, okay? Almost killed by his brothers, thrown in, uh, uh, enslaved, thrown in jail, but he still has, God is with him throughout all of this, okay? And you never hear him complain in Scripture. And he actually becomes so trustworthy to Potiphar that, that Potiphar puts him in charge of, keep charge of the rest of the, of the residents, the inmates there. So he does that. And some of the, some of the Pharaoh's guys, his cook and his maid, uh, his cook and his, uh, and his, I think his wine guy, they get thrown into prison and, and they tell Joseph that they'd had, had dreams. And he said, well, I can interpret those dreams for you. Let the Lord, let the Lord uh, tell you what those mean. Well, they told him his uh, dreams and, and he interpreted them for, for them. And he said, hey, when you get out of here, remember me to Pharaoh, okay? Let him know I'm not a bad guy. Well, they didn't. <laughs> they forgot about him. Until a certain point, when Pharaoh had a question and one of them said, you know, we did meet this one guy. And this is a year later or two years later. He's, you know, Joseph's still biding his time. Pharaoh sends for Joseph and Joseph interprets his dream. And in his dream, the country of Egypt is going to be done away with if they don't do something real smart for the next seven years. And that's what they did. Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all the gathering of the, of the grains, okay, so that they could survive the famine that was coming. And as a result of that, Egypt survived. Joseph was made second in command in Egypt, when Egypt was still a pretty decent place. And he was able to bring his family out of the way of famine and to Egypt. Now track with me. Out of Egypt, his, his family grew and grew and grew and grew, and they were the ones under, under a tyrant, Pharaoh, who Moses brought out, okay? Joseph had to suffer a lot of stuff before he was given the opportunity to marry a, a daughter of Pharaoh and have a good life. Here's what... Here's what Joseph said to his brothers when they had, they had figured out who, who he was and they, they were afraid he was going to kill them because they had been such tyrants. Joseph said, As far as you're concerned, you were planning evil against me, but God intended it for good, planning to bring about the present result so that many people would be preserved alive. It was probably jealousy that caused Joseph's brothers to treat him so cruelly. It was, definitely. Throwing him into a deep pit and finally selling him off to slavery, causing his father such deep pain for his young son being killed, he thought. But God, in his wisdom, turned a most heinous crime into the most beautiful story, culminating in a glorious finale. God had a plan, and he was working it. And it wasn't going to be fun for Joseph all the way along but he knew he could trust Joseph, and that's my point. God, in his foreknowledge, knew all that was to take place in the life of Joseph long before he was born, and God prepared the way for the brutish, bullying behavior of his 11 brothers to be transformed into a precious picture of God's protection and loving care for his people. When at last Joseph revealed that he had been made the governor of all Egypt, and was in a position to protect his entire tribe for the duration of the more terrible famine that was to ravage the world for seven years, Joseph was to comfort his brothers 
You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought to me this position so that I could save the lives of many people. Joseph is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved of the Father, hated by his brethren, betrayed by those he knew and loved, only to be used of God to save his people from death and destruction before being placed in the highest position in the land, carrying out the will of the Father. Pretty interesting. But this is not just a thrilling adventure story with a happy ending. This is a picture of the wonderful way that God takes and uses the most painful and difficult circumstances in the life of one that is trusting in Him. To bring about good, not only for ourselves, but for the many other people that touch our lives and who our lives touch. When evil and distressing situations happen to thwart our personal plans, how about COVID? Yeah, that's evil. That's distressing. The people that perpetrated this on us, the ones that dropped the beaker and went, oops, or created the thing in the first place, they could have never imagined that we would see this as a blessing and use it as a blessing. This is not just a thrilling adventure. When evil and distressing situations happen to thwart our personal plans, we have a number of choices. We can wallow in our our slow of despond, murmur against God for our misfortune and bemoan our sorry state as we become embittered with our lot or by faith we can trust in the promises of God knowing that no matter what happens in this life, God will bring good out of evil. He will bring life out of death and he will bring joy out of sorrow. God is turning. God is making all things beautiful in their time. And in this fallen, broken world, we're living for Christ. We're blessed. But it's a broken world. We're navigating a broken world. Boom, things things are going to go wrong. Jonah had to spend time in the belly of of a whale. That was his doing. But people were saved. God uses our circumstances, every one of us, every single day, every minute, to be a blessing to others. God uses all things to work together for the good so that even when others intend things for evil, government, politicians, God will use it for good, not only for our eternal benefit and the eternal benefit of others, but to benefit others and for the glory of of the Father. Lord, we're grateful today. Grateful that you sustain us, Lord, like a buoy that cannot sink because it's perfectly perfectly watched after. We're like a buoy, Lord God. The storm comes and the buoy rises. Doesn't sink. Still waters. The buoy is still a buoy. And it's also there for a reason, Lord God. People know where the rocks are. They know how to get to the channel. So we are beacons. And you keep us in a place where we will be a blessing for others if we will trust you. Then you will trust us back. I'm grateful for that today. I'm grateful for my friends, for the beloved friends who who catch this online, for, for my wonderful congregation. I don't see enough of and the wonderful, wonderful residents at JRCC. God bless them, Lord. We ask you to keep us smiling, Lord. Keep us positive to know that you are on the throne and nothing can happen that you have not anticipated and that if we will trust you and be trustworthy, you'll show us to the right people, Lord, who need us and who we need. And I thank you for that. Bless us in these understandings. We ask precious Jesus, show us how we can bless one another this holiday season. And coming up, Lord, this week, happy birthday, Jesus. Amen. This week I'm opening the church to to have a Christmas Eve service. And uh, at 4 o'clock, it'll be uh, 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes of readings and and songs. We're going to sing 
songs to our Lord Jesus Christ celebrating his birth and what that means to us and who we are to him and who he is to us. We love you. Hang in there. I'll see you in a week. Peace.